This video is brought to you by Raycon. Hey Wisecrack, Michael here. Today we're going over a topic of concern to both Big Tech and Big Shrek. What do I have to do to get a little privacy? Wow. Yes, privacy. The answer to Shrek's question is a little, well, complicated in our day and age. Do we uninstall TikTok? Sorry, I just had to wash my hands before getting in. Send a strongly worded DM to Mark Zuckerberg? Become a juggalo to foil facial recognition? Privacy is all over the news, specifically the many ways it's being trampled on. So exactly how angry should you be if the Chinese or American governments get a copy of your sick WAP TikTok? We take for granted that this thing called privacy is a universal good that we should share lots of think pieces about. But what exactly is privacy in the first place? Where did the idea come from and why does it raise such powerful emotions? And perhaps most importantly, why should we care about the state of privacy today? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of privacy. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon earbuds are comfortable wireless earbuds that are the solution for your podcast or music listening needs. I prefer these over other earbuds, mostly because I hate the hard shells that fall out of your ears so easily. Raycon earbuds also have different size gel tips, so you will always have a comfortable fit. They come in a wide variety of colors, so you can choose the pair that matches your style. Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of other premium wireless earbuds, and the audio is comparable to the brand you might know. Their latest model, the Everyday E25, is one of the best yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Raycon has a 45 day free return policy, so why not check it out for yourself? Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash wisecrack, and you can get 15% off your order. That's buyraycon.com slash wisecrack. Now, Back to the show. The concept of privacy as we know it now likely has its roots in a much more basic concept, namely property. The notion that certain things belong to certain people or certain groups and not to others. Yeah, we switched it up. Money, I knew it. Philosophical discussions around ownership are some of the oldest texts we have, and they lay out the separation between an individual and the group to which that individual belongs. And without that divide, talking about privacy is kind of pointless. The most well-known of these treatments comes from Aristotle, who posited a division between what we call the polis, or the public sphere, and the oikos, or private sphere. It's a healthy protein. Classicist Douglas McDowell points out that oikos could have one of several different meanings, depending on the context. In a very literal sense, it can mean an individual's house, but it can also mean all of the household goods that Marie Kondo wants you to trash, i.e. property, and under certain circumstances, family, which, I don't know, do they spark joy? In other words, the Greek oikos consisted of all those things which could be said to belong to the male head of the household. The property itself, the commemorative Plato tchotchkes. Oh, and also the women, children, and slaves that lived on said property. These things, therefore, did not belong to the polis, the public. Of course, many people didn't own land making this not a fun time. The very culturally specific distinction between the household and the public sphere is a big part of the foundational thinking that enables us to say, for instance, that data about our online behavior is ours and that it is therefore a violation of our rights to collect it without our express consent. We can see how by fast forwarding from ancient Greece to colonial America. There, this concept of private ownership was also a big part of the reason why, in between teeth pullings at the blacksmith shop, the founding fathers worked up such a collective head of steam over British intrusion into their affairs. As scholar Daniel J. Solove explains, revolutionary Americans had a very specific grievance with the colonial authorities. The founders detested the use of general warrants and writs of assistance. That is, you could have your house searched and your seized without any basis in evidence, and it was not uncommon for the authorities to grab the personal papers of dissidents and authors. Underlying the founders' anger was the belief that there is such a thing as personal stuff to begin with. In other words, they were willing to endure the pain in the ass that was musket warfare. One, two, three, fire! in large part to create a division between what the government does and does not have the right to inspect on demand. Key American figures were even wary of surveillance by their own government, so much so that they took to writing their post-revolutionary letters in code. This included folks like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton. 
Their orneriness would lead to the third, fourth, and fifth amendments. These prohibited the forced quartering of soldiers in a home without the owner's consent, established the requirement of probable cause for searching and seizing your stuff, and established the basics of a fair trial, respectively. These amendments further refine the concept of privacy with regard to individuals and their relationship to a liberal democratic government in an American context. But it wasn't until 1890 that the modern idea of privacy as a legal concept was fully articulated. That year, attorney Samuel Warren, an eventual Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis published The Right to Privacy in the Harvard Law Review. It brought immediate and widespread attention to the issue of people poking their noses in other people's business. Those two girls behind you, they're eavesdropping and publishing their findings in the tabloids. This was a popular concern in a time when increasing population size and rapid urbanization brought many people into closer contact than ever with their neighbors, and as a result, their domestic dramas. In the article, Warren and Brandeis argued that the common law conception of property protections ought to cover not just physical property, but intangible property as well, like your sorted Netflix watch history or your idea for the next great workout. Yeah, sure, eight minute abs. Yeah, the uh, exercise video. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is gonna blow that right out of the water. Listen to this. Seven minute abs. The way they saw it, the law wasn't keeping up with recent technological developments or the businesses that profited off them, specifically newspapers, the 19th century equivalent of TMZ. As they put it, gossip is no longer the resource of the idle and of the vicious, but has become a trade which is pursued with industry as well as effrontery. They noted that this new trade profited off of the details of sexual relations, which can only be procured by intrusion upon the domestic circle. Broadly speaking, privacy was then, as it is now, primarily about protecting your nudes. In more precise terms, legal scholar Dorothy Glancy claims that for Warren and Brandeis, the right to privacy was the right of each individual to protect his or her psychological integrity by exercising control over information which both reflected and affected that individual's personality. In this way, these two sepia-toned men expanded the concept of the private yet again to include not only the property in an individual's possession, and that which is restricted from government surveillance, but also what goes on inside one's head and anything that might impact that, such as potentially damaging gossip, or in today's day and age, your Tinder message history. More recently, in his 1966 study of surveillance technology, law professor Alan F. Weston pointed out that laws surrounding privacy depend on context, specifically whether you're talking about the privacy of your average citizen versus the privacy of the government. In Science, Privacy, and Freedom, Weston explains that different political systems treat privacy differently, and that norms of privacy are dictated in large part by culture and tradition. As he put it, certain Certain privacy patterns are functional necessities for particular kinds of political regimes. The modern totalitarian state relies, to varying degrees, on secrecy for the regime and full surveillance and disclosure for all other groups. In other words, the totalitarianism seen in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany required privacy for government paired with a forced lack of privacy for citizens. By contrast, at least in theory, the structure of a liberal democracy demands transparency for the government coupled with privacy protections for individual citizens. This statement seems perfectly obvious until you realize that even within liberal democracies, we've never actually reached a universal agreement about who ought to have what kinds of privacy and for what reasons. Philosophers, scholars, legal analysts, and others with a vested interest have continually argued about whether privacy is a good or bad thing to begin with. In his overview of the history of privacy and publicness, scholar Slavko Slikal points out that private relations may also be heavily authoritarian, violent, and even brutal. Protection of privacy may also have negative effects. Under the veil of privacy, abuses of power, including domination, exploitation, violence, tyranny, and censorship, as well as unlawful and unethical activities in families, corporations, and organizations, can be kept away from public monitoring and righteous sanctions. To simplify, privacy is great when it means keeping our browsing habits away from the NSA, but not so great when it's used as a justification for hiding child abuse in the church, violence in the home, and so on. Even Aristotle, the very thinker who helped define the private and public spheres, claimed that we must not regard a citizen as belonging just to himself. We must rather regard every citizen as belonging to the state. For all his talk of private ownership, in other words, Aristotle believed that the private realm extended only so far, and that an individual 
individual ultimately existed as part of and to serve a larger whole. Later challenges to the notion of privacy as an unambiguous good came from not only utilitarian philosopher and preserved corpse, Jeremy Bentham, who called privacy one of the most mischievously efficient instruments of despotism, but also feminist thinkers such as Carol Hanisch, who first coined the phrase, the personal is political. Hanisch and others challenged the idea that there is a distinction between the public realm of tweeting hot takes and the private realm of arguing with your partner about what movie to watch next. They argue that the relationship between husband and wife or mother and children are inextricably tied up with the politics of a broader society. To put it another way, if a society doesn't value women's agency, that same idea bleeds into the private home when a husband refuses to let his wife help decide what to watch on Netflix. The inverse is also true. If men refuse to let women make the hard decisions at home, like whether to rewatch Firefly vs. Battlestar Galactica, they're probably less likely to trust women to vote or hold offices. According to this strain of thought, denying the connections between public and private life allowed outright abuse and oppression to go unchecked as long as they took place within the home, beyond the reach of public scrutiny. Of course, this would seemingly make a slam dunk argument for you get no privacy on your phone because as lawmakers try to chip away at things like encryption, they'll inevitably point to someone doing something bad with all that privacy as a reason to take away yours. In spite of these complications, privacy still has its many defenders. In her article, What Privacy is For, law professor Julie Cohen argues that privacy is vital for the development of individual identity, or as she calls it, critical subjectivity. As she puts it, subjectivity is a function of the interplay between emergent selfhood and social shaping. Privacy enables situated subjects to navigate within pre-existing cultural and social matrices, creating spaces for the play and the work of self-making. According to Cohen, our subjectivity, that is, our sense of individual selfhood, as defined both by what's going on inside our heads and outside of them, a la Warren and Brandeis, requires privacy to fully develop. In order for us to form our own opinions, values, etc., we require a buffer zone between what we're thinking and doing and what the outside world can see, at least some of the time. This space between us and everything else creates a safe area within which we can try out new expressions of selfhood and make mistakes. That is, we can do so without fear of being mocked by the entire internet for thinking that a fedora would really complete our aesthetic, or being really, really into Twilight fanfic. Here we circle back to Weston and the question of why privacy is so damn important in the first place. You'll recall that according to Weston's theory, different kinds of societies need different relationships to privacy in order to exist. The liberal democracy we strive for, for instance, requires a great deal of privacy for its individual citizens. Marrying this with Cohen's understanding of the importance of privacy, we could argue that democracies have to be made up of fully realized individuals if they are to function correctly. In other words, when we lose our privacy, we gradually lose the ability to fully develop develop as humans outside of the public eye. And that's bad for a system of government dependent on the will of the people. And thanks to Warren and Brandeis, we have some idea about how to maintain that crucial space for individual development. Funny then that as a society, we're giving away our privacy like candy corn on Halloween. But seriously, for a group that's thrown such a massive sh fit about privacy invasion and data collection over the last few years, we seem to have very little problem handing over our deepest secrets to anybody offering a fun freemium game, and generally mashing that accept button whenever we come across a terms and conditions page. Fine, you don't want to be part of this, then just sign right here. No, you didn't read it! This says we don't ever have to let you out and then we can do whatever we want! But maybe that's not quite fair. After all, we're not just throwing our personal information away for nothing. When we permit a government or corporation to invade our privacy by handing over access to our data, we generally believe we are getting something of value in return. Use of a social network, for instance. As Weston points out, the need to socialize is a powerful one, and setting our privacy as the price of entry can make it seem cheap by comparison. He claims that each individual is continually engaged in a personal adjustment process in which he balances the desire for privacy with the desire for disclosure and communication of himself to others in light of the environmental conditions and social norms set by the society in which he lives. French philosopher and mirror impersonator Michel Foucault even went so far as to claim that we are forced to hand over our privacy rights in order to participate in society, which makes at least anecdotal sense. Even pre-internet, it's understood that by stepping into the public sphere, one loses any expectation of privacy as they scream at some poor Trader Joe's employee. 
Sure, you can get rid of your Facebook profile with a bit of effort, but doing so will cause a drastic increase in the number of friends' birthdays that you miss, and an immediate and marked decrease in the number of parties you get invited to. For another example, by now we're all mostly aware that Rideshare and other apps may track us even when we're not using their services. So how many of us actually went out of our way to delete those apps and call an actual cab every time we want a late night ride home from the bar? And that's not even touching on how easy it is to manipulate people out of their personal information even when they're trying to keep it safe. As Carnegie Mellon researchers discovered in their review of behavioral analysis and experiments on people's responses to privacy invasion, it is startlingly simple to con people out of their data. So much so, they concluded that to be effective, privacy policy should protect the naive, the uncertain, and the vulnerable. It should be sufficiently flexible to evolve with the emerging unpredictable complexities of the information age. So we find ourselves in a bit of a pickle. On the one hand, many of the technologies that make the modern world possible demand our personal information in exchange for access, and most of us have decided to fork it over. On the other hand, privacy is critical for the development of fully formed individuals, what Julie Cohen calls situated selves, who in their their turn are the starting point for democracy, which most of us at least still claim to want. How society will deal with this conundrum is still up in the air. There's some resistance to our compulsive data collecting, seen in the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, which requires companies connected to disclose many of their data collection practices, and Apple's most recent pro-privacy publicity push. Or maybe it's all futile. Either way, the issue of privacy is one we'll need to keep talking about, as long as we're still interested in being people who can govern themselves. What do you think, Wisecrack? What's the state of privacy in the world today, and where is the debate headed? Let us know what you think in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, and as always, thanks for watching. Later.